Listen, before you sit down, just say with me a couple more times. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Come on. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Once more. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. <laughs> That's good. You can be seated. And uh, you can, let me get myself situated here. I have two Bibles today. That means it's going to be, it's on. Caleb, it's on. Uh, I've got an NLT and an NIV. So um, we, have, we have scriptures on the screen for you. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. Let me just get my, all my stuff together. Colossians chapter 1 is where we're going to be reading from. If you've got a Bible with you and you want to, to follow along with your Bible, that's a good idea. It's a good idea to bring a Bible with you, actually. And um, one of the reasons why is that um, a, a practical thing would be, you know, it's handy to use your phone. I like to use my phone and all that. But here's why we encourage you to bring an actual Bible. If you're anything like me, and I like the phone, it's modern. I mean, I'm old school. I have a gray beard, so I get to be in the old school group. So paper is what we read from. But it's good because I, with a digital thing, before you know it, I'm distracted and I'm checking scores. Right, don't raise your hand to confess, but it's true. I see some of you nodding. So we encourage you, when you come to church, bring a paper Bible with you. And it will also help you get used to having it so you'll get used to reading it at home. And that's the big win, is allowing the Word of God to do its work in transforming us when we read it. If you're not aware, we are, as a church and our school of Jesus, we are reading a Bible plan called More, More Jesus 365. There's a poster on the wall out there at our connections wall. You can find it there. It's a version Bible plan you can get on your phone that you can read and follow along your Bible. I encourage you to do that um, because the Word of God transforms us and changes us when we allow it to wash over us. We want it to do its work. And I'm going to read for about five, and a, five or six minutes. I'm going to read through Colossians 1 from verse 9 until about uh, verse 10 of chapter 2. So follow along with me. Make no apologies for reading that long. If you've been here for a while, you'll see that this year we're having a revival of love for the Word of God. And so, I mean, why would it be bad that you would read the Bible a long time in a church? <laughs> right? So we're reading the Bible because and as I'm reading, yeah, let's not see it as an exercise of just kind of waiting to get to the end so Jim's got something to say. But allow it to, by faith, connect your faith to it as you hear it. Jesus taught a lot saying that he wanted us to have ears to hear and eyes that would see and hearts that would understand. And the Word of God is a book breathed on by the Holy Spirit. And if we attach our faith to it, then the Holy Spirit will breathe on it upon our souls and it will transform us. Sometimes, I mean, we love prophetic culture, meaning we love to use the gifts of the Holy Spirit, revelatory gifts, and we like that people would give us a, a word of prophecy or they had a dream about us. Like, who likes that stuff? It's fun, isn't it? When somebody said, I saw you last night in my dream, and the Lord said, wonderful stuff. The greatest place to get a prophetic word is the prophetic word, the Bible. The best thing about this is it's infallible. It means it doesn't make mistakes. I can make mistakes when I give you a prophetic word. I might have just ate too much pizza last night. And I dreamed up something about you. This is how you'll know. This is your anchor for knowing. The scripture says the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. What that means is it's going to help me separate what I'm making up in my own soul and what God actually wants to say. So be encouraged. Read your Bible, bring a Bible, and while we're reading it, whether it's me or any other leader or pastor that's up here, then just allow it to do its work. Expect it to transform you while you're, there, while you're sitting there listening and reading along. I want to say one other thing before I read, and it's this. I will not be put off if the Word of God is touching you and changing you if you yell out, hallelujah, amen. Whatever. If you want to celebrate while that's happening. And that's true every week. We want you to participate with us. We don't want to just be up here like talking and you're listening. Of course that's happening. But I want to encourage you to participate with what the Holy Spirit's doing in the room. The same way we do when we're singing. 
or when we're doing communion or we're tithing. We're doing it together. We're participating. So even in this time right here, participate. If the Lord is saying or doing something, you want to say something, it's not, it's not going to put me off. If you get a little too rowdy, I'll let you know. How about that? Do we have an amen? amen. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, and that's true for every week we're in here. We want to encourage just participate in faith with what the Lord's doing as we're listening to his word and receiving from his word. So here we go. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. says, Paul talking to the church at Colossae. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power, so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. <laughs> and there's more. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. <laughs> this gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's might, mighty power that works within me. I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you. And I rejoice that you're living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. And now... 
just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you, are also, so you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. Wow. There's a lot of things packed into there. And I'm going to try today to bring some things out of this passage that's going to help us align ourselves with what the Lord has been doing and how he's been directing and leading us at Life Church 7. Specifically, what I mean by that is we are on a, on a commission from the Lord and a direction of us fulfilling the Great Commission, which is for us to become his disciples and to make disciples. Pastor West taught on this passage last week and mentioned also Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, where this commission is given to the church. And I'm going to come to that in a little while. But I want to go back to a, a verse here and start to pick through some of these, uh, the high points that stand out for me today on, first, uh, sorry, on Colossians chapter 1. And let's go to uh, verse 12. And I want us to look at something stated right here. Actually, verse 13. It says, for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Here's why I have two Bibles here. I just read from the New Living Translation. So let me read it from the New International Version. Same thing. Same verse. It says it differently though. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, we don't have time today to go into a whole thing about which Bible version you should read. There's lots of really good ones in English. The case I want to make is that sometimes you want to look at different ones because it helps bring clarity to things that were written in a different language. There's written in New Testament, is written in what's called Koine Greek. So when you go to the original of these words, you see that they're translated different ways in these two versions. You think, well, why is this important? It's not a grammar lesson or anything like that. Sometimes a specific word really matters for how we set the course of how we align ourselves and what we believe based on what that word says. The, the New Living Translation made an effort when it said that we are rescued from the kingdom of darkness, and then it compares it with the kingdom of Jesus. And his kingdom has a capital letter K. I don't think we had that on the screen but it has it here in my Bible. In the NIV, it says that we are rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of his dear son. So the point I want to make is this. A kingdom presumes that there's a king. The devil has never been a king and will never be a king. And this is really important for us to begin to align how we go about in life sometimes. If you want to say about spiritual warfare or dealing with temptation or dealing with difficulties that we have in our lives. Is that we can give an elevation to the devil that he's not due. And we can minimize as if somehow the devil and Jesus are on some kind of equal par like competing rulers when they're absolutely not. Let's talk about what it does mean though. And how it does have impact on us. So I'm not going to go into giving you all the Greek words. I have them here in my notes. But you don't, it's not necessary to remember those. But here's the meaning of the word dominion. That we'll read it right there. And it, it gives this idea of having a, a right or an authority or an ability to exert influence. You with me so far? Dominion is that, I, you, let's think of the word dominate. What does it mean? That I have power or strength or authority over someone, I can dominate them. I can have dominion over them. That's the idea that Adam and Eve gave dominion to the devil in the Garden of Eden. They allowed him, by agreeing with him and his lies and eating from the tree they shouldn't have, they allowed him dominion over what they had dominion over. 
God gave them dominion in the garden, and, and he actually commanded them, go be fruitful, rule over the animals, the earth, etc., etc., right? So they had a rule, and they gave it, or shared it, or if you will, uh, it was subverted by the devil, and they gave dominion to him. Hence, sin and death is in the world, and why the enemy can sometimes have influence or power even over a Christian. If only if you give him dominion. And here's the good news. The gospel makes it so that we don't have to allow him to have dominion. Oh, caveat to this. The devil himself doesn't commit abortions. He gets people to do it. He has ideas about things. So his dominion is only able to be enforced where you and I would agree with him and participate. And when we're in our sinful nature, we're stuck with this sinful nature that dominates us and has dominion over us. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus has come by his death. He put all of that to death and by his resurrection displays a power over it that no longer has to have dominion over you. And how can he do that? Because he is the king of the kingdom of God. The word for kingdom here is a different word. It's not dominion, it's king, and it presumes a king. It presumes royal dominion. It presumes a realm, which is a territory under kingly rule. That's what a kingdom is, a territory under kingly rule. So let me see if I can help us understand this a little bit, because my goal, one of my goals today is for us to have Revelation from the Holy Spirit, a better picture from Colossians with the help of the Holy Spirit about who Jesus really is and that we would align himself, what we've been declaring today, that Jesus is Lord. Not as a catchphrase, but as a personal belief and conviction that I will align my life behind. So a little bit of cultural stuff here and a little bit of history, maybe. And um, that's not why you came here today, but let me just try to create some context for this. So, I am fully American. <laughs> meaning, I have American citizenship. Proud to be an American. I also, I actually have dual citizenship. So I have an American passport, and I have a British passport. Now, stay with me here, because I'm about to confuse you. You're thinking, he's not British. He keeps harping on about being Scottish. I am from Scotland. Scotland is part of the United Kingdom. So we have the same monarch that England has, that Wales have, that Northern Ireland have. We share the same crown, the same monarch, the same King Charles. All my life since I was a boy, it was Queen Elizabeth II. She passed away a couple of years ago. Now it's King Charles. So we share the same king. We have the same monarch. And on our passport, right, you have citizenship of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. Where am I going with this? In our culture, let's compare it with American culture. In the United States, we would rally behind freedom and the flag, let's say, right? Our flag is representative of our Constitution, Bill of Rights, the values that we have, Etc. Etc. Am I right? That's why you don't take it down a pole and let it touch the ground. We have all these rules. Because why? We're honoring this thing that's a piece of cloth, but it's more than a piece of cloth. It's something that represents the cohesion and the values that we have as a nation, a tribe, a group that we have together. It brings us together and it, we give it honor. So to the culture in the United Kingdom, to where I'm from, it's not the flag, it's the crown. It's the king or the queen that brings this cohesion and this oneness that gives some identity to who we're rallying behind. If you went to war in the UK, it wouldn't be for freedom. It would be for king and country. That's what we say. That's what we do over there. Okay? Why, why am I saying all this? To get a right perspective of Jesus' position helps us align ourselves personally and together about who we're following and why we're doing what we're doing. In, let me continue. 
our parliament also, we have two houses here, right? You've got three branches, but you've got two houses. We also have two houses over there. We have the House of Commons, and we have the House of Lords. And the people in there are actually lords. We still have that. And you get that title by owning some land and some other stuff, and it goes back to centuries of heritage. And I'll check this out. I'm actually a lord. <laughs> Not the lord. I didn't say that. A lord. I have the proof right here. I have this little certificate that I didn't bring to show you today because you're not allowed to touch it. <laughs> so I took a photocopy. And it starts like this, and it says, Know ye therefore. Now, whenever you use the word ye, you know it's about to get real. <laughs> know ye therefore that James Martin Sim, by the virtue of the ownership of land in Scotland, by way of dedication upon the effect and receipt of this proclamation. Okay, blah, 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 right? On we go. May henceforth and in perpetuity be known by the style and title of Lord. <laughs> Wes is loving this. Every minute of his <laughs> And shall hereafter to all and sundry, that's you, <laughs> be known as Lord James Martin Sim. You're welcome. <laughs> I just want you to know that this means diddly squat. And I'll tell you why, because you can get one yourself for $65 if you just buy. <laughs> I said, I'm serious, 65 bucks, you get one square foot of land in Scotland and now you can call yourself a lord. But here's, here's the interesting part about this. It is actually real. I'm not asking you to start calling me lord, please don't. That's not where I'm going with this. Sorry, that's different. You can call me Lord at home if you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But she would be lady. So I'm getting distracted. Where I'm going with this is <laughs> this means very little, except it does. You know when you when you, you you fill in your passport or an official document and it says type your name, your first name, your last name, and then your title. Mr. Mrs. Doctor, you know, you know how it has those choices? Well, in a British passport, you can put Lord in there. If I put Lord in there, which I'm legally allowed to do, I would be treated completely differently when I went through customs. Not here, but when I went back to the UK, people would see that. And there'd be a deference and a respect and an honor it would be given for that title. And I wonder... I wonder if a lot of our difficulty in accepting this marvelous invitation to be a disciple of Jesus is hard to embrace because I've seen him as my buddy. I see him as my bread and butter. I see him as my sidekick. I see him as the one who helps me when I'm a bind. And I haven't yet seen him in the title for who he really is, that he's Lord. Maybe it's time we were to treat him differently. He's still our friend. He's still our savior. He's still our healer. These are all the things he does. What makes that marvelous is that he's all of those things while he's Lord. That my friend is the Lord. And I, I think we've maybe forgotten some of that part. And that's what Paul's talking about and what he's doing right here in Colossians is he's stating all these titles, these high honors of who Jesus is. Let me read it from the NIV, verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. 
Some of the original words, the word kurios in Greek in the New Testament means Lord. That's how we translate it, to Lord. And it means master of all things with absolute authority. Master of things with absolute authority. Christ is what's used in here. What's interesting about the way that the Apostle Paul writes, you could do a little study on this if you want, but all through Paul's letters, his epistles that he writes to the different churches in the New Testament, he's, he often will, he'll often speak about Jesus this way, Christ Jesus, or the Lord Jesus Christ. He never says Jesus of Nazareth. I know I've done this, maybe you've done it too, and I think it's a good little correction for us. Is that sometimes when we're praying, I don't think it's a sin or anything like this. But sometimes when we're praying, at least I've done this. You get really excited, right? And you start listing all of Jesus' titles and his names. That's a good thing. Because it's building our faith and reminding us who he is. And somehow we've got this nice lyrical or poetic thing on the end. Jesus of Nazareth. Paul never calls him that. Jesus of Nazareth is what was used to identify him as a human. That God became man and lived on the earth. To become an atoning sacrifice for us, he had to be human. And he came from Nazareth in Galilee. But after the resurrection, he's not identified as who he is from here. He's identified by who he is from there. In Ephesians chapter 1, it said, And God placed him at his right hand over all rulers and power and authority. And then Philippians, And gave him the name or authority that is above every name. And his name is Christ. His name is Lord. His name is Messiah. His name is Son of God. His name is Ruler. His name is King of the Kingdom. So we don't need to say, In the name, when you rebuke a demon, Jesus of Nazareth. No, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Christ, Paul, actually, and in Colossians, let me see, I've got this written down here somewhere. In Colossians 1, 29 verses, there are 30 references to Christ. So we have Kurios, the Lord. We have Christ. And then I just read this from the NIV when he's called the firstborn. Now, if you're like me, for a long time I was confused about this. Because it didn't, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. Because the firstborn from among the dead. Well, I, I have four brothers. I'm the oldest one. So I'm the firstborn. So in my mind, I think chronologically, the first one to be born. But that's not what it means. If you go into Old Testament history, you'll see that God calls Israel his firstborn. Israel was not the firstborn. <laughs> Jacob. Right? He's not God's firstborn. Adam was actually God's firstborn. If you go chronologically. So this word firstborn has a different meaning. It means, and I love how the NLT actually translates it, supreme. The premier. The one who is above everyone else. The one who is ahead of everyone else in significance and importance and in value. And so Jesus is God's firstborn, supreme among, think of it that way, firstborn from among the dead. I used to get confused also because I think, well, Lazarus was raised from the dead, and he, that was before. And the widow's son was raised from the dead, that was before. So how is Jesus first? Well, he's supreme in this regard. The firstborn from among the dead because he never died again. Lazarus died again. The widow's son died again. Jesus is supreme in resurrection because he was risen once for all time for eternity. And he holds the power of life in himself, resurrection life. And he's the first installment of all the other ones like you and me that are going to be resurrected by putting our faith in him. Yeah. That's what it means. You see what Paul is doing? The Lord Jesus Christ. The firstborn. The supreme one. Above everything. Above everyone. Ruling. From the right hand of God. I want to read something here from a book I have. It's called the Jesus Manifest. No, it's Jesus A Theography, actually. It's written by two men, Leonard Sweet and Frank Viola. And I want to read what they write a little bit about this before we move on to my next, my next thought here. They write speaking about Jesus dying at the cross. He, say, he says this, because of that hill, the hill where Jesus died. Because of that hill, because of that blood, and because of that cross, you stand holy, spotless, blameless, without reproach, an accusation in the sight of a holy God. Yet that's not all. 
This Christ created a new humanity, a new creation, a new race like himself. That new humanity is his own body, a multi-membered creature we call the church, the ecclesia of God. It is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, kin to divinity. And this Christ is the head, the authority, and the source of that body. But wait, there's more. This Christ triumphed over the greatest enemy that God ever faced, death, the offspring of sin. He conquered its power, extinguished its sting, and dismantled the fear that was attached to it. Jesus Christ passed through death and came out in resurrection, and he is the first to return from the dead to never taste mortality again. But that's not all. In his resurrection, this Christ, the only begotten Son, shook off his chains, no longer bound by time and space. He became a life-giving spirit, the firstborn among many sisters and brothers, all of whom will be raised from the dead after him. This glorious Christ defeated death, the grave, the curse, the entire world system. He defeated sin, Satan, and all condemnation. He slew shame, he conquered guilt, and he shared his everlasting victory and towering triumph with you. Here is a Christ so grand and glorious that he is beyond the reaches of human comprehension. All things are in this Christ. All things are through this Christ. All things are for this Christ. And he has been given the first place in everything. What an incredible Lord. <laughs> so what now? Our invitation today is to, is to allow the Holy Spirit to help us to elevate in our beliefs how we see Jesus Christ as Lord and as King. Steve Backlund has a great quote that he uses. He says that you get saved by believing in Jesus and you're transformed by believing like Jesus. Meaning that we would believe every word that comes from the mouth of God. That we'd listen and adjust ourselves and our beliefs to what God says about us, to what God says about himself, to what God says about the world. And so here we are, we're getting this better, clearer picture of who Jesus is as Lord and Christ and firstborn and supreme and the creator. And there's many other things in there. So what now? So we look at verse 20 through 22 of this first chapter of Colossians. And it says this. Through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. I want to say something about this word reconcile because for a long time I'd read this passage and I'd be confused. And the confusion would come to me because when it says he reconciled everything, that even these things that are unseen, these rulers and authorities and so on, that he's reconciled all of it to himself. I would think, I would think well, that means all the demons. All the, how, how does that work if, if he's reconciling? So let's talk about that for a moment. This idea of the word reconciling would be to put everything back in its original role with its original authority under his. Let me say that again. When he's reconciling, God is putting everything to its original role with its original authority under his. Under Christ. That's what's just laid out right here about Christ as the ruler and authority and head over everything. And so by him becoming through his resurrection and his ascension to the Father, he now rules over every evil spirit, over every angel. He rules over everything. Everything is now subjugated, if you will, in its rightful place under his kingship. Are you with me so far? Okay. For us who are his disciples... We're not just in this subjugation. The devil is now defeated. That's why Pastor Wes says up here all the time. It's a spiritual declaration of the truth where the world's condition is at. That Jesus is on the throne 
The devil is defeated. Exactly. So we make that declaration here. But so there's the subjugation of the devil. He's now in his rightful place. Jesus is king of the universe. But for us humans, there's an invitation that goes beyond just being dominated. And it's into submission. And I'm going to talk about, and it's also into his great commission. That you and I are invited into a relationship. That's why it said he reconciled everything seen and unseen. But he also reconciled you who were his enemies. God has never been my enemy. God's never been your enemy. We were his enemies. And he reconciled us to himself. And what is it going to say? And brought us into his very own presence. So reconcile in that way. There's subjugation of the devil and there's submission. That I submit myself, I yield myself to him. And when I do that, my faith in Jesus now brings me into his very own presence. Whereby the darkness no longer has any dominion over me under his kingship. One of these other... Gentlemen here are going to be teaching from Colossians the next couple of weeks. Maybe they'll go into it. But in chapter 3, it says that your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When I submit myself to the realm of the king, I'm protected and I'm covered and my life's hidden. I mean, how much better could it be than that as far as feeling secure and protected in your life? That your life is hidden with Christ in God. There's a part to this, though, that's really important. I can still allow the domination or dominion of darkness over me by one simple thing, disobedience. And obedience is connected to following. How could you follow somebody when they say, this is the way we're going, and you go, no, thanks, I'll go that way. I mean, it's kind of dumb, Right? It should be simple for us that if we're the followers of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus, hence automatically we're obeying Jesus. We're going where he's going. We're doing what he's doing. He said that himself, Jesus, I'm only doing what I see my father doing. He's following and he's obeying. So following and obedience go together. And, and if, I'm in, if I'm following where Jesus is going and I'm obeying him, I'm hidden with him in God. As soon as I go into not following and disobedience, I've now returned for the opportunity for the dominion of darkness to have power over me. And that's why some of our stuff's being stolen. And when I say stuff, I mean your money, your marriage, your health, your relationships. Worse, your inner peace, your joy your sense of assurance in life, your ability to sleep. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Most of these things you can go straight line right back to disobedience and not following. Because when I'm under the covering of the realm of the king, I'm hidden with him there. And so is every part of my life fully secure. The devil can't touch it. <laughs> he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And transfer us into the kingdom of his dear son. This is a glorious promise that you and I have. Brandon Rice has a, Brandon will be here uh, soon. He's going to be speaking, teaching in our school of Jesus. And he comes here every year and he's just a great man of God and he has a, a great thing that he says is that we don't invite Jesus into our lives. He invites us into his. See the subtle switch right there. Now, I know it's okay for us to say, invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. I'm not saying we should never use those words again. But the concept, there's a higher concept here of it's not Jesus making me better and helping me out. It's me following and obeying him as Lord, as Christ, as firstborn as supreme and as creator and savior and deliverer and so on. I don't invite Jesus into my life. He invites me into his, into this marvelous invitation to keep following and following him into his glory as a disciple. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1. Here's another comparison, verse 27. Let's read this together. 
In the New Living Translation, it says, For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. See how it reads in the New International Version, it says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, don't raise your hand. Do you know what that means, the hope of glory? I don't know what it means. I was talking to Gary about it this week. Gary has the answer to this question. <laughs> Let's be honest, sometimes we just make stuff up. We do. We read something in the Bible and you just make up a lot of ideas. I mean, it's okay to have ideas and think it through and try to discover. But Paul talks earlier on about having spiritual wisdom. He's saying, I pray that you'll have spiritual wisdom and understanding. He goes on to say more about that in a moment. We're going to come to that before we conclude. But we need spiritual wisdom and understanding for being in the presence of the Lord. is the only place you can get that. Otherwise, we just start making stuff up. Because when you think about this thing, this hope of glory, what's he talking about? Well, it gives us a clue, actually. He says, Christ in you. So if hope is about my joyful expectation of the future of his glory, it's Christ in me, but he's in me now. But he's also going to be more than he is now when I see him face to face in the future and I'm in a new glor glorified body. So there's something about this that he's, he's, he's provoking us to where he's saying it's a mystery. And then he actually goes on and he says this. Look, I'm running around here because I'm excited. You see what I'm doing? I just, I just was aware I'm doing that. I'm going to start preaching my head off in a minute. But so I try to calm myself. Here's why. My spirit's apprehending what I'm talking about even though my mind doesn't understand it. My, I, I don't have all the theology for this. But my spirit's apprehending something. What is this? Christ, the one I just talked about. The Lord, the master, the creator in me. The hope of glory. The glory of my future. My future is bright. My future is awesome. So is yours. We're going to get resurrected. And we're experiencing his glory in us right now. And we're going to go from glory to glory to glory. Until we ascend into the fullness of his glory. Seeing him face to face. This is our hope. Christ in us. Don't you want to be his disciple? I mean, come on. What's the alternative? Follow the Republican Party or follow the Republican Nonsense. Our future is so bright. What's going to happen on November 6th? Whoever gets elected, nothing changes in heaven. Nothing will change in heaven November 6th. This year, next year, the year after. Why? Christ is in us. He is the hope of our glory. We have a glorious future ahead. Let's not get aligned with political agendas. Let's get our align alignment correct by having spiritual wisdom and understanding that comes from following this one who is the Christ, the firstborn from among the dead, supreme over everything. There's my hope. There's where I'm protected. There's where I'm safe. There's where I'm secure. There's where I'm joyful. There's where I'm peaceful. Come on. I I Beth is laughing because I do that thing, and she wanted to make a bobblehead of me doing that. <laughs> but they were too expensive. Really? She was going to buy bobbleheads, but they were too expensive. Because she called them and said, can you make a bobblehead of Lord James Martin, Sam? They said, no, too pricey. But look at this. Paul says this. It's a mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. But then he goes, but I want them to have confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan which is Christ himself, in him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In 1 Corinthians 2, Pastor West quoted earlier, we actually have the mind of Christ. And by our relationship with the Holy Spirit, he will take us into these treasures and into these knowledge. That you know what? You might never have the words to explain or the intelligence to line it out together. But your spirit can know it. And you can know this glorious fellowship as we follow the one who is Jesus Christ, the Lord. You don't have to be able to articulate it all. But you can experience it all. You can know it all. 
because God wants you to know it all. The Holy Spirit said he would come and he would guide you into all truth. Jesus said he'll take what's mine and he'll make it known to you. And he'll also tell you about the future. <laughs> you know what the future is about? It's not about who's going to win the next election. Or how much money you'll have in a bank next year. He might tell us that. You know what the future I believe is showing us is? The hope of glory. That he's going to unveil and reveal to our spirits what it is to go from glory to glory to glory. Which is just being basically raptured with his presence. Of knowing him. John chapter 17 says, and this is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. That's our glory, knowing him. Let's go, John 17, I don't want to butcher this. Let's read this. If the worship team would come up, that will help me, remind me that I got to stop at some point. I could keep going today. John 17, verse 22 to 24. Check this out. This is Jesus praying to the Father about us. He prayed, for his, he prayed for his disciples, and then he prayed for everyone that would become disciples on account of them. So that's us. This is what Jesus is praying for us, sitting here today. I have given them the glory that you gave me, <laughs> that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. That's what Paul's talking about, Christ in you. So that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Wow. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Just stand with me, please. I want to give us something to hopefully grab onto to apply what we're hearing today, what the Holy Spirit's speaking to us. We're all hearing the same words, but the Holy Spirit's speaking. Some, the same to some of us and individual things to some of us. And I want to encourage you now, just right now, as we're getting ready to conclude and Mark will come and help us, but to begin to apply this truth, I want to read a scripture here and, and, and ask you to be asking the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me from this message? Will you give me spiritual wisdom and understanding? I didn't just come here to do some kind of pep talk. I know you know that. We could just go encouraged at a superficial level. And we have thrown out some of the names or titles of Jesus without apprehending them in our spirit. And align our lives actually behind him, under him, for him. So ask the Holy Spirit, what is, will you give me spiritual revelation, understanding, and wisdom of how to live out what I'm hearing today? And that's true of every time we're in here together. But here's what Matthew chapter 13 says in verse 11. You are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. This is the mysteries that Paul's talking about. They're hidden in Christ. If we're following and we're aligned with him, we're going to get more revelation. When we step out and disobey, we start losing whatever revelation we've had. Here's what he says. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. There's a, there's a warning there for us that we ought to apprehend what it is the Spirit of Jesus is saying to us and want to have ears to hear and eyes that see, a heart that understands. The simplest way to do it because everybody has the same invitation is to say, Jesus, I will make you Lord and I will follow you. And Paul said it here in Colossians that not only do we accept Christ, but we continue to follow him. 
And you're here today, all of us, most of us, I'm sure, I know it, have accepted Jesus as Lord. He says that, exact words. Now that you have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to follow him, to live in him. Build your lives upon him, it says. Go home, read Colossians chapter 2. So that's our invitation today. Would you close your eyes with me? Let me just pray for you, and then Mark's going to come up and give us some instruction. But I want to pray as I just finish up here. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the victory that you have accomplished on our behalf and for all of mankind. Thank you that the church is growing throughout all the nations of the world and bearing much fruit. <laughs> Thank you that people are being born again and filled with the Holy Spirit and delivered from the dominion of darkness right now as we speak all over all the nations of the world and even in this place right now and people watching online. We declare the dominion, the rule the effects of darkness being broken off of our lives in the name of Jesus as we follow and submit ourselves to the Lordship of Christ, the firstborn supreme one over all the dead. The resurrection and the life. Jesus is Lord. So Lord, will you help us by your spirit to apprehend what you want us to have today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Mark's going to lead us.